Hello, greetings and welcome, my dear, dear listeners. My name is Heretical Hatter, and I welcome you to the fourth episode of my series Tau Empire Reimagined. Today, we're finally moving on to the best part of my rewrite, and the main part of my rewrite, the history of the Tau. And today we'll be speaking about the very start of a Tau history, from the unification of a Tau species, all the way to the end of the first sphere of expansion. And you might think that, wait, didn't the first sphere of expansion basically encompass an entire re- sector of space? Well, you will figure it out soon enough. So, my darlings, let us begin. Before we start our tale about the Tao history, it is worth to mention that the Tao don't use human calendar. As one could expect, the Tao homeworld doesn't exactly works the same way as the Holy Terra itself. For the sake of clarity and of keeping the history of a Tao from perspective of a Tao calendar, you as a listener must remember. The Tao year is around 300 Terran days. Each day on their planet is only 15 hours long, so not only the Tau as a planet is closer to their home system star, but also the rotation is a bit quicker. With that all in mind, let's start with the early history of the Tau. As you most likely remember from my episode about the castes, you know that the Tau were divided race before the Ethereals came and united them under the idea of a greater good. Four types of tribes were most common on the Tau homeworld. On the arid steppes ruled the fire caste as great hordes of nomads. The riverbanks were dominion of the earth caste, where they built their first cities and the true fundaments for the Tao civilization. Mountains belonged to the air caste, where the Tao managed to tame flying beasts and fly from one end of the world to another. And finally, oceans, seas, and the shores of the world were under control of a water caste. The traders, the diplomats, schemers, and pirates of this world. However, this stage of very clear division happened in the late 35th millennium. The Imperium and Explorator fleets of the Mechanicus discovered Tau a bit sooner than that, in the middle of the 35th millennium during the reign of blood. The planet was marked to be cleansed of Zeno's life and put as a future colony for the Imperium. However, the rule of Gauche van Dyer slowed most of the uh, imperial operations, as this maniac and tyrant put the Imperium into chaos almost as great as Horus' heresy. What is important, however, from the perspective of a Tao history, is that around the same time as the storm of Emperor's wrath 
ripped the void asunder and destroyed the fleet of a tyrant, another warp storm appeared far, far from the heart of the Imperium. The Imperials named it the Crystal Sphere Storm, for it was different from any other storm ever recorded in the history of the Imperium. For this storm didn't seem to have its origin within the heart of a sphere. Quite the opposite, in fact. The warp storm was the sphere as if some strange energy started to radiate out from the heart of the sphere and the warp itself reacted as organism trying to hold it in place. Whatever tried to enter the Milky Way galaxy, the Chaos Gods didn't like it, and so put quite a lot of work to contain this strange power. As far as Imperials were concerned, however, this strange, bizarre storm was just impossible barrier. Only the most desperate or the most mad of void craft would dare to enter this region of space and try to get inside the sphere. And so, in typical Imperial fashion, the whole region was forgotten, and the strange barrier was left alone by the Imperium for next 6,000 years. The only things that tried to enter the sphere were of course orcs and few chaos fleets. What is most fascinating about this warp storm, however, is that no chaos invasions originated from it. In fact, even the chaos fleets that tried to escape into this warp storm, back into the hellish reality of the warp, didn't seem to survive the trip. A warp storm which was the size of a sector was basically safe. No danger came out of it for 6,000 years, and it was just next door to the realm of Ultramar, a realm that was quite well prepared for any invasion and they knew how to keep their borders in check. And despite all this, for 6,000 years, one of the biggest warp storms in galaxy was absolutely unremarkable. Nothing of importance happened there, outside of few orc invasions going straight into it and swallowing them whole, nothing of importance happened. The Inquisition, of course, studied this warp storm for its strange properties, but they couldn't figure it out. It was too bizarre for them to comprehend, and travel within the sphere was deemed too dangerous. And if there were any attempts to do so, they didn't succeed. So, from Imperial perspective, there was a sector-sized warp storm from which any chaos fleet didn't emerge. In fact, it swallowed quite a few dangers and basically just stood there, menacingly doing absolutely nothing. So they mostly ignore it. From the Tau perspective, however, they were within that sphere, the, this bubble which protected them from the outside galaxy, which allowed their civilization to grow and thrive. Although the fact that they were in a bubble doesn't mean that there were no dangers in the bubble already, or that by the power of stupidity alone, some orcs didn't manage to enter the sphere. So, we spoke about the Tau Kalendar, 
and the region of space in which the Tao Empire, or well, United Authority, developed. Now it would be good time to tell about how the United Authority came to be. In case of the lore about the unification, I am not changing too much from the original story. The core of the unification of the Tau race was Montau, which I translated to War Between Tribes. The late 35th millennium was the age of constant war between the tribes on the Tau homeworld. The fire nomads of the plains united into multiple great hordes and fought not only against each other, but against every other tribe trying to take control of their entire planet. The river empires built greater and greater world cities and did their best to defend their land, fighting against everyone who would try to steal the fertile soil of the riverbanks. High in the mountains, the air tribes united on their great leaders and started raiding all other tribes over the world, stealing their goods from the air, spreading terror and fear in the hearts of many. The water tribes created great fleets, doing their best to protect their islands and shores, fighting against far more numerous enemies. Many other tribes, including those who weren't of the fire, water, air or earth type, also fought for domination. It was the age of war, of enslavement and of death. It almost seemed like a madness took over the entire Tau society, or well, Tau race, Tau species, and they were ready to destroy themselves before even figuring out the gunpowder only for the sake of domination. But they couldn't. For the great tribes were quite evenly matched, and so they couldn't defeat one another. It was a stalemate between the great empires of the era. This era of disorder, of blood, came to an end with the appearance of the filials. During one of the greatest battles in the known history of a Tau, the Battle of Theo Town, the Ethereals appeared. Theo Town was a city of the Aircast, one of the greatest of its kind. It was a city of such size and magnificence that the greatest empires of the ancient Earth will be jealous of its size and power. The Theo town was a capital of the greatest of the earth cast empires, one which aimed to unite them all. Its power was hard to comprehend and almost impossible to challenge. And so, the water cast, fearful of the power of a city, made some moves in the shadows. They managed to convince one of their great rivals, one of the fire tribes, to attack the Theo town. And for five long years, the greatest city on the Tau surface was under siege. And after those five long years, one ethereal walked out of the city into the t camp of the fire tribe and one ethereal came out of a fire camp and went into a city. Those strangers, who no one knew and nobody saw before, spoke about unity, about peace, and about the future of the entire species. And so, first came the truth, then came peace, 
then alliance and then unity and combining of the greatest of the river empires and the greatest of the fire hordes. That's how unification of a Tao species began. Tribe after tribe, empire after empire, a horde after horde was brought into the fold of a greater good. Of course, unification wasn't easy or simple. After all, the wars which lasted for hundreds of years and bad blood which was born from this conflict couldn't be simply wiped out with one move of a hand, even by someone so charismatic as Ephelios. There was also a problem of the tribes and people who refused the ideas of greater good, or proven to be resilient to the ethereal's ability to manipulate. You heard it about before, but this was exactly the moment when the cleansing of the mixed communities began. The ethereal's ordered the cleansing of tribes which didn't well, didn't want to listen to the idea of a greater good. The greater good. For the greater good, entire civilizations were wiped out and then forgotten. Their history destroyed and knowledge about them suppressed. Ephelials wanted that the blood spilled in the name of unity to be forgotten, but the knowledge that the fundaments of the unity were built about the bones of innocent couldn't survive into the ne next era. 120 years after Ethereals revealed themselves to the wider population, the Tau race was united under one banner. The United Authority. As you probably noticed, I decided to change the symbol of the United Authority, or well, the Tau Empire, as the Imperials know it in the future. My previous symbol was just a bit shit, a bit messy, so I think that this one is much, much better. I mean, it keeps that theme of rings and spheres of the Tau, and, you know, more Far Eastern theme with the five beams of light, symbolizing five castes, which were united under the greater good. The new Tau society, united under united authority, was ruled by the High Caste Council, an interesting form of governance. For one would suspect that Ephelios took full control of the Tau society and kept full control over everything they ever did. This isn't the case. Each caste had their own council members. In fact, each caste had their own council. Those councils are responsible for internal matters of each caste, and they are composed of the greatest members of the caste. And each council has their own leader, an equivalent of a chancellor from our perspective, which is known as the High Counselor, or the more common name is Supreme. So there is Fire Cast Supreme, the Earth Cast Supreme, the Air Cast Supreme, and the Water Cast Supreme. And of course, there is Ethereal Supreme. It's just a coincidence that the Ethereal Supreme is usually the Supreme of the High Cast Council. As we all know, all castes are equal, but some castes are more equal than others, now don't we? <laughs> One of the first decrees of a high caste council 
was establishing of united calendar for the entire Tao species. And so it was decided that the year when Ethereals showed up during the siege of Theo Town would be the year one of the new calendar and the start of the era. From that point on, the age after Ethereals showed up is known as Era of Unity. And it was year 120 of a new calendar when the entire Tao species was united. Year 120 of Era of Unity is also the very first year of the 36th millennium by Imperial point of view. So, my darlings, what do we have now? The start of the 36th millennium, and in only 120 years, the Ethereals managed to unite the Tau race. So what's now? Straight into the void? Oh no, no 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 no, it won't be so simple. While I enjoy the idea of a Tau being a race which advance in impressive tempo, I think that the speed how they expanded wasn't really thought through by the writers of a black library or lore creators in the game's workshop as a whole. As such, I will tell you that, that despite the fact that Tau managed to unite in the 36th millennium, they won't manage to escape from their star system until the 38th millennium, especially taking into account that they were in the age of bronze at the best when they were united. So, my darlings, here's my take. I give the Tau around 1,500 years to fully industrialize their homeworld, but also to start probing at the void of their home system. The next 1,000 years I give them to start colonization of their home system and terraforming or well it shouldn't be called terraforming now should it should it be called tau forming maybe it should be called tau forming huh. either were another four planets and creation of habitats around different celestial bodies in their star system i think if we start looking at the tau advancement and expansion through the perspective of their calendar, and we balance it out, it will become more reasonable. Like here, if I said that it took only 2000 years for the Tau to colonize entire star system from the age of bronze, most of you would tilt their head and eh, that sounds a bit like cheating. But if I say 2500, it sounds at least a little bit more reasonable. And when I spit it that 1500 was for industrialization of the home planet itself, and next 1000 for colonization and terraformation of the neighboring planets, it's even more reasonable because if that's important, even if planet was tau formed or terraformed, whatever you want to call it, and colonized, it doesn't mean that it has, you know, great or very numerous population. So, more reasonable. From the perspective of a tau, however, this age was a golden age for them. You know, expansion, colonization, the start of spreading of a greater good to the entire star system and start the plans to do so outside their borders. This was a time when Tau thrived. But that doesn't mean that 
they managed to achieve everything they wanted. One of the things which couldn't be achieved was discovery of FTL drive. The Tau couldn't figure out how to move faster than light. Their technology simply wasn't advanced enough at the time to do so. The greatest minds of the Earthcast couldn't figure it out. In fact, many believed it was simply impossible, at least with their current knowledge of uh, reality. And so their fears made a simple decision. The very first sphere of expansion will begin with the ships without FTL engines. They will start with sleeper ships. And so, at the very dawn of the 38th millennium, at the year 2570 of the Age of Unity, first sleeper ships moved out into the dark expanse of space. So, the first sphere of expansion, year 1 to 400 M48 or 25070 to 3060 of Era of Unity. And some of you might be confused and ask, wait, what, what, what the fuck? Did it, isn't the first sphere expansion the size of an entire sector? In canon, it is, but I'll be honest with you, the idea that the first sphere of expansion, or what Tao would call the first sphere expansion, is the entire region of space they took control over before they met the Imperium of Man, is a bit shit. Like, like this puts the concept that the meeting of the Imperium was so important for the Tau that no other event in the entire history for 6,000 years didn't make them say, okay, here ended our first expansion, let's start the second one. That's a bit of shit lore. And so I'm changing it. And you will see in the future episodes that every sphere has their own theme and starts with something interesting. The first sphere of expansion is the time when Tau didn't have FTL. They didn't have a way to move faster than light. So they went on in the sleeper ships and they spread out slowly. This sphere of expansion is also the start of only three new sept worlds. Not counting the Tau homeworld itself, as it was the first sept. I even made a little map for you to enjoy. The very first new sept which was established and the very first new colony of a United Authority was Taun famous for its massive shipyards and numerous space stations. The Earthcast is dominant in this sept. In fact, many see this sept as a home of a Tau navy. This sept is responsible for creation of majority of a Tau navy. The next sept is the Anoi. Established as a manufacturing world, the Sept was rich with resources and had great potential. For unknown reasons, however, the Sept was cut off from the rest of United Authority. How or why it isn't known, but the world survived. The people there became a little more suspicious and backwards with their way of thinking and prefer more conservative military tactics compared to other septs, but they are loyal. The sept itself became very important manufacturing world after it was reunited and brought back into the fold. The last sept which was established was Bor Khan. 
accept what became the very heart of science and academia of entire Tao society. Accept of universities, of for every caste, and studies in all possible directions. Military study, physics, everything was there for the Tao society to advance. So, the first sphere of expansion, three new sept worlds, four including the homeworld itself. This doesn't seem too impressive until you realize that those little regions of space already constituted around 16 worlds under the Tao Empire. Sure, it usually took around 50 years to reach the nearest sept, but it was a start. During the first sphere of expansion, the Tao didn't find any new species. No one to spread the world of a greater good to them. In fact, ethereals were getting desperate, because despite the advancement in technology, they still couldn't get their hands on working FTL system. It took decades to send a message, usually around the lifetime for a Tau. If they tried to spread any further, the Tau society would break apart. New empires would form, and the Tau would kill Tau, just like in the Age of Disorder. So, the expansion slowed, and then stopped. The greatest fear that the idea of a greater good couldn't be spread throughout the stars was becoming a reality. And then, a miracle happened. In the year 3060 of the Era of Unity, exactly 438, the unknown vessel entered the space of the United Authority, and a message was sent to the Ethereals. We come in peace, and we need your help. The very first race that the Tao met was not only friendly, but was in need of help from the Tao. And most important of all, they had an FTL drive, and Ethereals were more than happy to help in any endeavor if they could get their hands on this technology. So ended the first sphere of expansion. The second sphere and the first war among the stars was just about to begin. Well. I think this is a good place to stop for now. We spent quite a lot of time talking about the start of a Tao history, all the way from the unification of a Tao species to the meeting of a first Xenos that soon would join the greater good. In the next episode we'll be talking about the second sphere of expansion. Why a different species found Tao and asked them for help. And about the first war among the stars Tao ever experienced. I will also attempt to talk about the Xenos found by the Tao in this time, or I will have a minor episode dedicated only to them. Either way, that's it for today. Now, my darlings, remember, wherever you are, whatever you do, do try to have some fun today. I wish you most heretical day. Ta-ta!